Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildebrandt. I am joined, as always, by my good friend, my co-host, my colleague of many years, a fine gentleman in New York City, by the name of Dan Rubenstein. Sir, how are you? I am on the show, Ty. Yes, okay. I am on the show. You can subscribe at iTunes.com slash Solid Verbal. You can also follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Snapchat, and on Instagram. We're starting to get some snaps from people, Dan. Nice. We're getting some snaps from folks out there who are at games. Our friend Arden, who asked for some advice going to the great city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. She has been sending some updates as well. We had another gentleman send us some updates informing us on the deep frying process of uh, a turkey a couple weeks ago. Okay. Uh, I Stay was safe. I was in communications with him. Yes, I told him, please do not burn down your house. We don't want you to burn down your house. But it mm-hmm. seems as if he took the necessary safety precautions. Yes. Um, week 11 is now upon us, is it not? It is indeed. Here we are. Week 11, there's, there's not all that much going on. However. However. We have breaking news. Ah. Uh, Man, uh, give me something good, Ty. We have breaking news. As you know, um, it was a late night for many of us here in the United States. We were up all night counting votes. Mm -hmm. The results are in. Yep. Your college football playoff rankings for week 11 are as follows. Number one, we've got the Alabama Crimson Tide. Number two, we've got the Clemson Tigers. Number three, we've got the Michigan Wolverines. And number four, drum roll, please. It is, in fact, the Washington Huskies. They have leapfrogged, um, well, nobody to get to <laughs> number four. I mean, a number of teams leapfrog Texas a and yeah. I guess the concern that we illustrated on our show when we did it on Sunday was that maybe Ohio State might find some way into that top four. Perhaps the committee wasn't quite feeling Washington yet, but that does not seem to be the case. Rounding out the top 10, by the way, we've got Ohio State at five. We've got Louisville at six. We've got Wisconsin. We've got Texas A&M, Auburn, and Penn State. Dan, any surprises here? Um, Some people were surprised that LSU fell all the way to 24 after their loss. We were talking to Bruce Feldman on Twitter. Um, They scored zero points at home. Yeah, They are decidedly far away from being competitive on a playoff level at this point, even though they played good defense against Alabama. No huge surprises. Nice to see Penn State move into the top 10 after their decisive win against Iowa. Colorado moves up. They're at number 12 now. Um, The interesting thing right now when you look at the playoff, just in terms of who could sort of uh, from down the stretch they come, figure out a way into the top four. Auburn, certainly, with two losses, has a shot. If they win at Alabama and win out in the SEC, it'd be probably hard to keep them out. Wisconsin sort of has their own outsider shot if they are to win a Big Ten championship game. Um, You know, Ty, we've given the playoff committee a bunch of crap in years past. Weeks past, Mm -hmm. but years past as well. Um, I will give them this. It is a vote that they can change. (laughs) It is a vote that they can change. And uh, I suddenly feel pretty good about that. Uh, No, the the vote, the top four this week feels about right. Uh, Judging their strength of uh, their their schedule strength points that uh, Ohio State might have an argument over Washington with how dominant they were against Nebraska. But I, at the moment, am happy to reward an undefeated Washington season, even with a down Pac-12. They do not control how good or not so good Oregon or Stanford or any of these teams are. Yeah, what's notable to me, as you look at the top four, you've got Alabama, Clemson, Michigan, Washington again. All of those teams are undefeated. And I think, maybe with the exception of Michigan, we're assuming that Alabama, Clemson, and Washington will remain undefeated from this point forward. That, to me, just... What is this, our ninth season now of of doing a college football podcast? 
That to me is is always just a weird recipe <laughs> for a strange late season upset. And look, yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through the schedule. I'm not gonna point out who Clemson could lose to or who Washington might lose to. We're gonna talk about Washington here in a little bit, but all I'm saying on the surface, we've seen a lot of strange things happen in the world of college football and beyond. Mm-hmm. Whenever you've got that kind of recipe in week eleven, things tend to get whack. You're right. So we'll see. We'll we'll see what happens. Um, certainly, Ohio State's got a shot. Louisville's got a shot if some stuff goes haywire as well. You mentioned Penn State. I'm happy for Penn State. Depending on how things go, I could see them getting all the way up to six or seven, which is a wonderful story. Absolutely. Some other news, injury news, really in the world of college football. It was announced this week that Chad Kelly, Swag Kelly. Mm-hmm. Out for the year now with a torn ACL that, of course, ushers in the Shea Patterson era. Potentially. Yeah, I don't know if that's official. Yeah, Hugh Freeze is not. Shea Patterson, of course, being the blue chip quarterback who had the, the plan all along this season has been to redshirt because he is the future. But it, I think, accelerates at least the decision making on Shea Patterson and the era that will come with here down in Oxford. Mm-hmm. Kind of sad to see Swag Kelly go out. It hasn't been the kind of season that Ole Miss would have hoped for, Mm -hmm. certainly on the defensive side of the football. But you'll remember the talk headed into this college football season was that he was the best quarterback, best returning quarterback in all of the SEC. You hate to see it end like this for him, though I would suspect we'll see more of him on the next level. Yeah, who is the best quarterback in the SEC now? Is it Jalen Hurts? I think it's Jalen Hurts, yeah. There, there's part of, like, as as a playmaker at quarterback, I think that's probably right. But as a pure thrower, I I might go Sean White. What a strange world it is. What a strange world. I know I know our, uh, our pals at Pro Football Focus have him very high up on their adjusted completion percentage. He does really well in terms of per pass. He is, he is quite efficient. But, yeah, I it's not Jake Hubenek. Austin Allen? Austin Allen, there's a, an argument to be made. Yeah, he's he's put up chunks. Uh, I don't know who it is. Yeah, uh, it might be Sean White. I was going to say Danny Etling, but okay. Moving on, <laughs> another injury in SEC land, SEC Westland at that note. Mm-hmm. Trevor Knight, also out for the season with a shoulder injury. He could return for a bowl game, but in the interim, Jay Kubinak, who took over for him a week ago. He will step in. Kevin Sumlin said that he's waited his turn. You know, he's saying all the right things about his backup quarterback. That makes this week's game between Ole Miss and Texas A&M all the more interesting, if only because of the quarterback situation. But, you know, you, you hate to see this to anyone. Trevor Knight was such an integral part of what it seemed Texas A&M was trying to build offensively, that dual mm-hmm. threat that they had working down there was really something to behold. Now, I'm not feeling totally confident about them maintaining that eight spot as we progress through the rest of the college football season. It would appear to me as if that's a spot that Auburn could jump up and take, that Penn State could jump up and take, just throughout the normal course of events as we progress through the final four weeks of the college football season. And they finish with Ole Miss at home. Uh, a pretty dangerous, and this sounds very strange to say, but UTSA has been playing really well this year. Um, and LSU, Thanksgiving weekend, I believe, in College Station. So there you have it. That's all I got uh, college football news-wise. We will get to perhaps some other nuggets a little later on in the program. But in the meantime, Dan, it is week 11. Dan, time, help. I need picks of the week. So we're going to try our best to help you through college football's week 11. Speak for yourself, Ty. Okay. It is not (laughs) the healthiest, meatiest, most exciting slate of college football, but a few intriguing matchups that we're going to try and talk our way through here. Let's first start at a high noon. An ABC game between Oklahoma, who is at home, and a 16-point favorite, Against the Baylor Bears here. Now, that's... um, It's up to 16? Yeah. That's a significant set of digits, Dan. The undercurrent is that things are coming apart for Baylor. Yeah. I am always hesitant, as I said on our last show, to, like, promote that narrative unless I know for sure. And so what I try to do is I, I try to read what some of the team reporters are saying. And, of course, with all things Baylor, I reach out to my good friend Peter Pope from Our Daily Bears. Always. 
he responded to me via text message saying, yeah, things are coming apart here. <laughs> like, yeah, yep, everything you're hearing is true. There's a chance they don't win another game for the rest of the season. Other Baylor fans might feel differently about that, but at least in the eyes of one that I trust, it's not going well for Baylor. When you've got assistant coaches defending a fired coach, despite a giant game against an in-conference rival, as was the case a week ago, generally speaking, not a recipe for success. So with that being said, despite the fact that I vowed time and time again to go complete opposite of all of my gut instincts here in week 11, alas, I am going Oklahoma minus whatever. It does not feel like a very good situation for Baylor. The fact that this game is in Norman, I think, gives Oklahoma a distinct advantage, not the least of which is clearly they are playing very well on offense. So give me the Sooners minus whatever here, Dan. Yeah, and Oklahoma coming off of a bit of a struggle against Iowa State on the road. It's in Norman. Joe Mixon, Samaj P. Ryan are expected. Samaj P. Ryan, I'm going to pronounce that correctly, are expected back. They have a, a longer week of of prep. Uh, yeah, and they should be back to being efficient and explosive with that option, and perhaps the best receiver in the country with D.D. Westbrook. Um, yeah, Baylor was abysmal last week, and. It sort of begs the question, what is Baylor playing for beyond just get the season over with so we can just power wash everything that is happening in Waco with this football program? Um, it, I guess, could be seen as a positive. Maybe Baylor's refocused to get away from Waco and all the distractions therein, but I, I just, I'm not buying it, Ty. So I have 45-21 Oklahoma. 45-21 Oklahoma. Oklahoma, I believe, is... 11th in the college football playoff rankings, somewhere in that range. Um, I think they're probably better than Penn State, if you're putting a gun to my head and asking me what I think. Yeah, Trace McSorley isn't the most accurate quarterback, hasn't been completing the most. I think it's something around 50%, something like that. And so, yeah, Oklahoma, with when their offense is firing on all cylinders, I would take them ahead of a few teams that are ahead of them. The other nugget regarding Baylor was that some news came out that uh, the NCAA won't be pursuing any kind of Penn State-ish sanctions down there in Waco, which, you know, to the extent that you care about things on a a football level, I guess that's uh, notable. Mm -hmm. I am curious, though, to see what kind of coach they get to come in there. It's a delicate spot. I feel like it would be a really tough situation for a new up-and-coming head football coach. I don't think a Tom Herman's interested in a spot like that. I don't think a PJ Flex going to want to go to a spot like that. No, I would imagine it's going to be Sonny Dykes, if I had to guess. Sonny Dykes, another Texan, yep. right? Yep. Let's stay in the great state of Texas, Dan. By the way, Shock Linwood suspended for that game. Just oh, speaking good. of disciplinary stuff uh, for reportedly shoving an assistant coach last week. All right. Speaking of the state of Texas, let's go to Austin. Love going to Austin with you. That's right. The Texas Longhorns, a two-point home favorite. Dust mine yeah. eyes deceive me here, Dan. <laughs> That's about right. Texas playing pretty decent football. They played good defense in the second half last week. Offensively, Deonta Foreman is the sort of explosion onto college football this, these past, what, five or six weeks. And West Virginia... The, the two best things in this game are West Virginia, particularly how well they swarm on defense, and Deonta Foreman and the Texas run game. So, they're at home. Edge goes slightly to Texas, I guess. Texas minus two at home against West Virginia. Dan, this is a dangerous game for West Virginia. It is. This is, Dan, I'm saying it in hushed tones, man. You don't want to... <laughs> you don't want to overlook this game. My uh, first read here is that you want to go Texas minus the points. And uh, I say that for two reasons. First, you've got West Virginia with uh, good numbers against the run, but yep. you mentioned him. You say Deonta, I say Deontay Foreman <laughs> leads the nation in rushing yardage per game with 180. He is far and away the most prolific running threat that the Mountaineers have faced and may face all season long. Absolutely positively a test for them. And secondly, it sort of feels like Texas has nothing to lose at this point. Was it Nick Saban who once referenced something like this? Uh, Much different context, mind you, but... Right. Well, they have have Charlie Strong to lose, but yes. Basically saying you don't want to be in a a situation where someone else has less to lose than you. Right. That makes it a dangerous situation, I think, for uh, West Virginia. So with all that as the backdrop, 
given my initial read was Texas minus two, let's talk about how balanced West Virginia is right. and why it makes sense to go West Virginia plus two. Uh, it's probably worth it because Skylar Howard, he had the one really bad game, and granted it was on the road, a lot of travel at Oklahoma State, had those two really bad picks that gave short fields. Uh, the Oklahoma State defense is average, which is better than the Texas defense. So it is a possibility that that was an aberration for a top 15, 20 quarterback in Skylar Howard, and they look more balanced on offense. They play really good defense. They should be able to keep Texas in front of them. From what we've seen this season, West Virginia is the better team. Texas may come in playing better football right now. So I think in a line that I would have assumed this would have been flipped, that West Virginia would have been favored by a couple points because Texas is, I'm going to go with Texas by a field goal here. I'm really? Gonna say, yeah, I am. 20, 24, 20. So field goal ish. Wow. Yeah. I think it makes sense to go West Virginia because it's against my intuition first and foremost. And secondly, if Russell shell, <clears throat> my favorite weird name is healthy and he should play in this game. I think you can make the case that the Mountaineers are balanced enough really on both sides of the ball to win a, a close kind of game. Whatever kind of game it ends up being, if they need to throw to win, I think they can do it. If they need to run to win, I think they can do that too. The big one is if you're counting on someone to get a stop. If it's a close game and you need a defense to get a stop to win, I have way more faith in West Virginia than I do Texas. That's reasonable. So I'm going to go West Virginia. I don't know score, but I'm going to say West Virginia <laughs> wins this one outright. Big win on the road in Austin, and we'll see where the chips fall regarding Charlie Strong. He needs yeah. this one. He needs this one at home. It'll be huge. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So we uh, disagree, if we I disagree. understand correctly. Yes. Let's pay some bills Let's before we move on here. College Football Week 11. Let's go and talk about our good friends out at Seat Geek. It is the smartest, easiest way to find tickets for football games you want to see up close and in person this season. Nothing quite, of course, like being in the stadium for the biggest plays of the year. With SeatGeek, it's never been easier to get guaranteed seats and get them at great value. All you got to do is download the app on your phone. It's easy. We both have it on the phone. You still have it on your phone, I'm assuming. Absolutely, I do. You never know. You just never know when the spirit's going to move you, when the time is right to get some tickets for you and the missus. Maybe not for a football game, but to do concerts, do all kinds of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. What's really cool about SeatGeek is that they grade all the tickets. So they go out there, they search all the ticket sites, they, they find the tickets for you, and then they got some cool stuff going on in the background where they can evaluate ticket prices. They could tell you, depending on the game or the seat, whether or not it's worth your while. Help you get your most bang for the buck. Every seat on SeatGeek is backed by a 100% guarantee. So you can shop for tickets with confidence, Dan. It's best of all, Solid Verbal listeners, you get a $20 rebate on your first SeatGeek purchase. In order to get that, all you got to do is download the app for free. Click on settings, click on add a promo code, type in Solid, S-O-L-I-D. They're going to send you 20 bucks after you make your first ticket purchase. Pretty straightforward. That's a great deal, yeah. SeatGeek, it's a free app. The promo code is Solid. You make a purchase, Dan. And you're going to get $20 in free rebates off your first purchase. What a deal. 3.30 on CBS. It is Auburn. A 10-point favorite here, Dan. Wow. On the road at Georgia. Can we check in on the great state of Georgia for a second? Because it's been a while. Sure. Sure. Been, been a while. This is a 5-4 and four team, 3-4 and four in conference. Uh, a young team, not particularly impressive right. this season. But Jacob Eason's got a great head of hair. Got True. tremendous arm talent. The offense as a whole has been pretty bad, which has kind of been the joke, right? That's sort of the joke <laughs> for, for Georgia this season. Auburn's got a top 15 caliber defense, so combine the two does not look like it's going to be easy for Georgia to find those points. But I, I feel like some of Auburn's momentum may have been stopped by Vandy a week ago. By John Franklin. Oh, by Vandy. Okay. I feel, is it fair to say that the fact that Auburn needed to bring, quote-unquote, injured <laughs> Sean White off the bench to help them win this game, does that, does that feel to you at all like some of that momentum may have been halted here? No, I think it's, it's halted because Vanderbilt plays really good defense, and Zach Cunningham is great, and Derek Mason's a great defensive coach. I don't think there's any shame in not scoring a ton of points against Vandy, but 
I think there's something to Auburn struggling week to week to beat people 52 to 3. That is mm, an, an okay. unreasonable expectation. That said, Georgia's been playing decent enough defense, and they're 10 point dogs at home. So they're home dogs. I don't know if they're your, your Yako's home dog. Don't but, steal my thunder quite yet. Uh, I don't. I said I don't know, but. Um, I have some concerns about Auburn offensively, just going on the road, playing against a decent enough defense and beating them by double digits. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go Georgia plus ten. Interesting. My gut is to say that Auburn and the resurgent running game that we've seen as of late, and this like newfound efficiency in the passing game, which you talked about with Sean White before, um, my gut says that they're gonna be able to cover the ten. However, however, it is opposite day, Dan. <laughs> it is opposite day. Let's go ahead and do it. There it is. The Yakos home dog of the week. Let's make the dogs our Yakos home dog of the week. I agree with agree. you. We're going to say Georgia plus the 10 here at home. 7 p.m. Another SEC clash. On ESPN, we've got LSU traveling to Fayetteville to square off against the Arkansas Razorbacks. It is November. Um, um, oh, um, ah, borderline erotic. Um, oh, um, ah, um, oh, borderline erotic. So I'm, I'm going to say the same damn thing I said a week ago when Florida played <laughs> Arkansas. Yeah. Conventional wisdoms that LSU is going to grind it out. By the way, they're a seven and a half point favorite, I should mention. Mm-hmm. But uh, that aside. Conventional wisdom is that LSU is going to grind it out with Leo Fournette. They're going to play shutdown defense. They're going to they're going to win this game. Right. Two very strong forces in the college football universe are, are tugging at you here. Which and, are? and I want I want you to take note of this, Dan. On one hand, you got LSU, which has been really good since Ed Orgeron took over last week. Take that out of the equation. Still a really good team. Probably a better team than Arkansas, if I'm being honest. Mm-hmm. Certainly on defense. Yeah. On the flip side, though, you got Arkansas. And it is November. And you never want to underestimate Arkansas in November. They didn't let Florida run at all last week. They got their own running game going with Raleigh Williams the third. Mm-hmm. This has... Shout out to Raleigh Williams the second. Absolutely. Yeah. This has the third the, wouldn't be here without him. This has the ingredients of a body blow game. <laughs> For LSU, because Bama ran the ball 43 times with Jalen Hurts and Damian Harris and Bo Scarborough. Mm -hmm. That reminds me, you know, of that old video clip of the guy getting shot in the stomach with the cannonball. Not easy to recover from that kind of effort. Mm -hmm. 10-0, hard fought. Initial read here says go LSU. They're the better team. But body blow theory, November. Arkansas looking better as of late. We're going to go opposite. We're going to go Arkansas to cover the point spread. And uh, I think another low-scoring game, LSU wins 21-17. But I like Arkansas plus 7.5, Dan. I agree. Um, Arkansas is in the playoff rankings, are they not? They are. They are number 25? Did they just sneak in? Just under the radar, yeah. Yep. Um, Yeah, I'm going to take those points as well. I think Arkansas is the team... The November thing isn't necessarily that they finally get their act together and they start wearing teams down because of the the powerful play or the powerful style of play that they employ on offense. It's partially due to that. For whatever reason, I also think it's a confidence thing, that it just takes them a little bit, sometimes when they have a new quarterback, to find their rhythm. Arkansas's defense, make no mistake, and the, the Florida offense is no way to judge a defense because, man, that Florida offense can be bad. <laughs> it can be real bad. Um but I think there's something about the confidence that this Arkansas team has that they are able to do it against an LSU team licking their wounds uh, that got up so much for last week's game at home against Alabama. I think it's a huge letdown spot. So uh, we are, what, two years removed from Arkansas shutting LSU out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's at least a belief system in some of these coaches. Uh, I'm going to take Arkansas to take to, to cover these points. I don't know if they win outright, but it's, it's a very tight game. I agree with you. I'm going to go Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may come back and lock this one up. Wow. Super contrarian. Yeah. Okay. Mm. 7.30 on Fox, Dan. I need I need some insight here. Yeah? I do. I need your Pac-12 wisdom imparted upon me. Sure. We've got Washington. We've got Washington at home 
a nine point favorite now against the USC Trojans. I believe I saw that that game day is going to be there. Is it not? Yeah, game day is there. Does it surprise you at all that this line's only nine? No, not at all. USC has been playing on a much higher level than they were in September. Defensively, they seem to have their act together. I'm still not... I like Adoree Jackson a good amount. I'm not crazy about USC against the pass. I don't think they quite get to the quarterback enough. Hard to judge that against Oregon and Oregon's offensive line. But I think USC, especially in running the ball with Ronald Jones, with Sam Darnold's ability to avoid pressure and just sort of become a playmaker, underrated as an athlete, uh, USC has moved into a position where they could, with all cylinders firing correctly, beat anybody in the Pac-12. Yeah. But, 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 but. I think the stadium is going to be crazy. Uh, the game day presence is going to be very fun for Seattle and Husky fans. Jake Browning is particularly good under pressure and is really good downfield. And game planning has always been a strength of Chris Peterson and his staffs. And I just think Washington is able to consistently take advantage of some deficiencies of USC defensively that uh, the Huskies are able to take this. We saw what they're able to do getting up for a big game, an emotional spot against Oregon, certainly yeah. not a good team in Oregon, and just blowing the doors off of them. I think Washington does something similar, even without Joe Mathis, their best pass rusher, who's out for the foreseeable future, uh, if not the season in general. Um, I don't I don't like USC's offensive line at all. And we saw what Washington was able to do with regard to pressure against Stanford at home with only four dudes. Uh, I really like Washington to destroy USC's offensive line and to force Sam Darnold into a couple of mistakes, which he's been prone to doing. I'm going to take Washington here. Uh, let's go 37-24. Okay. This is a fun Saturday night game. Any, any way you look at it, um, I like the fact that we have a few options on Saturday mm-hmm. night. You know, this isn't the greatest slate of games, but at least you got some options and you can sample a little from Washington each. Washington-USC is good, yeah. Yeah, USC's been fun to watch. We talked about LSU-Arkansas. My hunch is that that's going to be a different kind of game. My hunch is that the 8 o'clock game between Michigan and Iowa, which we'll touch on next, is going to be a different kind of game, a different style of game altogether. So you got some options here. This, though, this is the game I'm I'm most curious to see. I think you can make the case that USC is the best team on Washington's schedule. Oh, disagree. Who would you take, who would you take right now over USC? Wazoo. You think Wazoo's better than USC? Absolutely. And isn't that game in Pullman? The game's in Pullman, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Washington State's better. I, I think USC is extraordinarily underrated. And I find myself rooting for them, rooting for Clay Helton after the rocky Look start he got off to. I know It's a weird place to be a lifelong Notre Dame fan mm-hmm. and, and be saying this stuff, but... The running game has improved an awful lot. I I know you're not crazy about the offensive line, but the running game's improved drastically. Part of that is, I think, because they've played teams with bad rushing defenses. Yeah, that helps. But certainly the uh, efficiency numbers, the opponent-adjusted numbers, like what they've done an awful lot. So that's notable. The passing game with Sam Darnold has been objectively awesome. 20 touchdowns, 4 interceptions... He's just a freshman. You compared him. Who'd you compare him to last week? Cardell Jones. I mean, that's a pretty just good in, comparison. And how difficult it is to bring him down and how adept he is at extending plays and sort of scramble drilling uh, an offense down the field. Yeah. So I, I like USC and I find myself rooting for USC. My initial instinct, I, I must be honest, was Washington because I don't know where the weakness is. Okay. I, I guess you, you try to run on them. Is that what you try to do? Uh, yeah, you can try to run on them. They they're susceptible to some misdirection at, at linebacker, but yeah, there's not all that much you can do. You got to hope for big plays. They've given up some big plays. Well, other than that, no, I think their their secondary is locked down yeah. for as much attention as Adoree Jackson and Biggie Marshall get for USC. I think uh, the starting corners for Washington, led by, by Sidney Jones, are even better. So, um. No, I don't know. I think it's sort of a weird field position thing. Get a a, a turnover that that starts you a drive at the twenty three. I think that's what you got to count on. Yeah, and I USC is good enough for that. They they are. I I don't get the warm fuzzies about the USC defense. Okay, 
Okay. I got the Mr. Softy sound here. I'm not going to play it. I'm not going to be mean because I'm rooting for USC. But Wow. Um, I just think as a whole, statistically, this team is 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 sneaky good. I have a hard time getting past Alabama and Stanford. Tough to get those out of my mind, but I'm going to stick to the plan here. Outside of that Oklahoma Baylor game, um, I'm going George Costanza opposite night. Um, I'm saying Washington wins, but like 24 8. No, we'll go more. We'll go 34 28. USC okay. plus the points on the road. Wow. Okay. All right. Have you, you haven't been to a game in Seattle? I ha- I've heard such good things about it's fun. I've never Listen. been to Seattle as a city. It's not just a game. Oh, I haven't man. been to I've been to Portland. I've obviously been to LA and places in in California, but never been to Seattle. Oh, it's a good time. It's I mean, I've mentioned this before on the show. The Pacific Northwest in general, great summer destination. I read an article that Seattle is on one of those hidden fault lines. That's entirely possible. I mean, the supposedly the next big tsunami is hitting Oregon, it's hitting the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, transition to awkward. Well, seg. I mean, this, we've got a we've got a good good transition here. Speaking of an unstoppable force of nature, uh, Michigan is favored by a lot oh, of points. Oh, look at you! That was good. Thank you. A pros pro, Dan Rubenstein. I'm trying. I'm I'm pulling everything I got today. Ty. Yeah, you're doing well. Okay, 8 p.m. on ABC. This is a game between Michigan. And uh, Iowa, Michigan's a 21 and a half point road favorite. My initial instinct is that that's a lot of points to give on the road at night Mm -hmm. because you've got a a savvy coach in Kirk Ferentz, I guess, provided he's got one of those graphing calculators that he's got to have a TI-83. Were you a TI-83 or a TI-89 guy? I feel like the 89 was banned. The 89 was banned, but I had one. Oh, I was I was 83. I played a lot of what did I play on that game? Tetris. What's the game where you're No, I played some Tetris, but the game where you're falling is like bricks or something like that. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah, I forget that game. So can I can I come clean here? Go breaking yeah. news. Are you just gonna admit that you cheated in high school and like pre-calc? I was going to go there with this, yes. <laughs> okay. I don't know if it's ever been revealed, though, the depths to which um, the cheating scandal went. Um, in my calculus class in 12th grade, I'm not a okay. math guy. I'm a wordsmith, Dan. As yeah, you know. obviously. Look at you. TI-89s were banned in my calculus class, 12th grade. Okay. And what would happen was, because they, it was sort of like a, a, a rule that went into effect after our class after pretty much everyone in my class had the TI 89 already. So Mm -hmm. what the, what the teacher would do is he would say, okay, I I know everyone's got a TI 89. We've got a bunch of TI 83s here that are assigned to this room. When it comes time to take the test, bring your TI 89 up, put it in, take a number and uh, we will give you a TI 83 that you can use for your test. Right. Seemed very fair to me. Right. Yeah. Um, but rules were made to be bent, Dan, and in some cases Man. broken. What I would do, because I am an enterprising wordsmith, <clears throat> mm-hmm. I would bring two TI-89s. I'd borrow a TI-89 oh from a, a friend in another class. And um, when I took my TI-89 up, when I put it in the box, came back with the TI-83, I'd put that in my backpack and pull out the TI-89. And on the last day of class, did you stand up and go, the prestige, <laughs> the prestige, and walk out with your C plus? This, I'm not a very controversial person. This, is, this right. is like the worst scandal I've ever been a part of. Would you say that the integrity of this kid wasn't so concrete? <laughs> is that what you would say? I would say that. Okay. There's only a small percentage of folks listening who will understand that reference, but... Yes. Ty's high school nickname was the Concrete Kids. Concrete Kids, yes. Yeah. All right, so where are we? What is this game? Michigan, at Michigan, Iowa. Iowa. I just went on the radio with our friend Trent in Des Moines. Trent Condon, and correct? Trent Condon. Yes. Love Trent. Hello, Trent. Picked Michigan to blow the doors off of the Really? Office. Yeah. Really? Okay. Um, we actually have an email here from a verballer, and since it is kind of a light week, I was hoping maybe we could address an email or two. If you're interested, please let's indulge. This comes from Brian. 
And he says, guys, I'm in a, I'm in a tight spot here. I bought tickets to Michigan at Iowa expecting to see a nice matchup to top 15 teams. I think that's a reasonable perspective. Yeah. He was hoping to see a game that had a role in the playoff race. Fast forward to present day, it's clear Harbaugh is going to be close to a 90% discount at Ruth's Christ after this game. Yeah. I'd like some advice on how to approach Saturday night. I'm swaying between tailgating with hard liquor so as to not remember the game or getting approximately 9.30 p.m.-ish reservations at a nice restaurant to have something to look forward to during the, uh, during the night. Any advice would be appreciated. So Brian's already writing this off. Brian has not specified, by the way, if he is an Iowa fan or a Michigan fan. I'm assuming from what right. I'm hearing here, he's, a, he's an Iowa guy. I would assume Michigan fans enjoy Michigan playing well, to my knowledge. I, I don't know if I would treat this as as any different kind of situation, to be honest with you. I think I would go. I would honor the tickets. I would enjoy the tailgating experience. Yeah. I would assume it's going to be a beautiful fall evening in Iowa City. I would I would go at this the way I would a normal football game. And I think you will see some injection of energy from the fact that it's a game against a top five opponent currently number three in the college football playoff rankings, mm-hmm. but also a, a a night game at home. Those tend to have a lot of energy. So at least for a short period of time, it should be a lot of fun. What I would say is go and tailgate, do your thing like you normally mm-hmm. would, enjoy it, give yourself like a halftime ultimatum. If things are going south, then maybe you go early, beat the traffic, and hit that restaurant anyway. Disagree. Okay. If you go, stay. Uh, it's going, it's going to be clear weather-wise. I've just looked it up. At 8 p.m., it's going to be 40 degrees. So, Ooh, okay. if if I had tickets for Oregon Stanford this weekend, for example, and I saw that it was going to be 40 degrees, I don't know, maybe I'd tailgate and go home and watch. <laughs> HD maybe I is a wonderful to, thing. I hang out with some friends. Maybe I make some new friends, whatever. But, man, I am soft, Ty. I am soft. What do you think the final score is? You said Michigan's going to blow the doors off Iowa. Yeah, uh, like 45, 17. Okay. I'm just not seeing it. We, we've we said this a bunch of times, that we've got this spreadsheet, and we look at yards per carry, for and against. We look at passer rating, for and against. I believe it's against Power 5 opponents, because that's the, the thing that we care most about. Right. What's interesting is that Iowa's numbers are virtually the same on offense and defense. They are 51st in yards per carry on offense, 51st in yards per carry allowed on defense. So perfectly symmetrical. Uh huh. In terms of the pass, 58th in quarterback rating on offense, 64th in quarterback rating allowed on defense. So they are nothing if not consistent. My mm-hmm. problem here with Iowa is that I, I don't know what they're supposed to be, Dan. It's not a talk to your kids about Iowa type of situation. No. Here. Talk to Iowa about Iowa and figure out what this team is supposed to be. What I saw last week against Penn State was a very average football team that didn't have much of an identity. And I really want to take Iowa here because I love taking home dogs at night. It's a three touchdown line. Plus he got the hook in the half point, but I just don't know if this is the team to push Michigan. And I got to go against my gut. I got to I gotta side with you. I, I like my home dogs at night, but I just think Michigan is so much better. I agree with agree. you. I think Michigan could hang 50 on Iowa. You know, if Penn State, if Penn State could put 41 on them, Michigan yeah. could and probably wants to hang 50 plus. My question is, if Iowa's defense hits their, you know, Josie Jewell, they have some very high quality players on this Iowa defense. If this defense plays to its absolute ceiling and is making every open field tackle and is hanging with Michigan receivers, you know, hanging with J.U. Chesson and Amar Darbo, Mara Darbo, um, and they they sort of create a wall at the line and just doesn't let anything through, what is the the point total that Iowa needs to hit offensively if they are just locking Michigan down to ensure a win over Michigan? Ooh. I don't know, Dan. That's a great question. I mean, we saw Wisconsin do a, all things considered within the context of the schedule, a really good job 
And they held Michigan to 14. Michigan left a couple field goals, left some points on the field. But they, they held Michigan to 14. Wisconsin's defense has a higher ceiling than Iowa's. I yeah. would say that Iowa would need to score 24 against this Michigan defense. Yeah. In an absolute best case scenario at home in an emotional spot. I don't see Iowa scoring 24 points against this Michigan defense. Yeah. I just don't. Yeah. So if the absolute best, best case scenario is them losing this game, to me, I think a plausible scenario is them losing by a lot. Yeah, I'm going to go Michigan. Minus yeah. the points. Go against my gut here. I do love those home dogs, but Michigan is so good. They're so balanced. I'm going to go. Mm-hmm. Got to go Wolverines here. Um, okay. Agree. Let's pay more bills. <laughs> I have a confession to make. We do we do spots for Harry's all the time on this show. We're we going to do. do one here. I ran out of Harry's. Oh, no, Ty. <laughs> I ran out of Harry's on Monday morning, and I was sporting like a nice five-day growth mm-hmm. on my chinny-chin-chin, which is a lot for me. Usually, I'm like three, four days, then I, then I shave it off. But I was going about five days. I had a bit of a thicket growing. <laughs> I ran out of Harry's, had to use a competitor's blade. Oh, no. I am still healing from my beard of bees. <laughs> I got a full so on beard of bees. I ripped the crap out of my face. Ty, I'm so sorry. I'm not feeling great about this. It's very irritating. And I wish I had my Harry's. I got to order more. You would think they'd send me more, but they didn't. <laughs> it's not their fault. It's my fault. Uh, you want to use Harry's. They've got a five blade razor with a lubricating strip, a mm-hmm. soft flex hinge. For a comfortable glide, they've got a trimmer blade for hard-to-reach places, as well as a textured handle that is easy to control when it's wet. You get all this for about two bucks a blade. Compare that to like four bucks, whatever you're going to pay at the drugstore for a more name brand (laughs) razor, Dan. Harry's actually owns the razor blade factory in Germany. That's where Mm -hmm. they make the blades which means they can produce high-quality razors all to themselves and sell them online for just, like, half the price. So listen, I am confident that you're going to get a good shave from Harry's, and I am confident in that because I just tried a competitor's, and it didn't work so well for me. Don't make the same mistake as Ty. Clearly, go with Harry's. They're going to send you right now their free trial set, which is extremely popular. It comes with a razor, five blades in a cartridge, uh, shaving gel. When you sign up for the shave plan now and pay just three bucks for shipping, they're going to give you post-shave balm, which I use. Yes, balm. Creamy. All you got to do is enter the code SOLID, S-O-L-I-D, at checkout and get that balm for free. Again, harrys.com, enter the code SOLID at checkout. Claim your free trial set and your post-shave balm, Dan. All you got to do is pay $3 shipping. One more time, H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Your offer code is SOLID. 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 (laughs) Some other noteworthy games. Let's run through these very quickly, Dan. I just want to go rapid fire here. As if these games are the Oregon defense. Let's go through them quickly. Thursday night, 7.30 p.m. It's a rivalry game. Rivalry between two rivals on Tobacco Road. We've got (laughs) North Carolina traveling to Duke. Yeah. They are a 10.5 point favorite here. Dan, you know we're big fans of the whole Duke quarterback situation. Talked about it a week ago, but is there any reason to think here that Duke could actually pull the home upset over UNC? Harry Giles, Jason Tatum. Um, Grayson Allen are all names of Duke basketball players. Yes. Um, I think Daniel Jones is an intriguing talent at quarterback for Duke. He's very young uh, and could take advantage of North Carolina's defense some, but I really like the combination of North Carolina running backs right now, Hood and Logan, yep. uh, to eventually pace North Carolina in this game 31-17. I like the fact that they're running with Elijah Hood again. Yeah, That was a missing component. He was banged up a little bit earlier this season. I like him a lot, so I'm going to go UNC as well. Um, also on Thursday, a later game, Utah minus six on the road at ASU. This is a weird, weird kind of line to me. Okay. I don't like anything about ASU. 
Okay. I do like Utah. I like Utah's fundamentals, but I feel like this should be a bigger line, and I'm wondering, oh, Pac-12 expert, if there's something I'm missing here. Utah's defense is not what it has been these past couple of years. Um an ASU perhaps could take advantage. I don't know the health situations of ASU right now on offense, but uh, I'm going to go with Utah here. I think they're going to be able to run the ball against Arizona State, a team that had, it's sort of like an every other week. Some weeks they're just completely locked down against the run. Other weeks, like we saw Colorado and, and Oregon, it's just uh, an open house getting to the second level. So I'm going to go with Utah here to win by a touchdown, 27-20. All right, I'm going to go Utah, too. I'm going to agree with you. Agree. Saturday, 12 p.m., high noon. We've got mm-hmm. South Carolina at Florida. Florida is an 11.5-point favorite, Dan. I read an article. Came down. This week, it did come down, by a fine gentleman by the name of David Sally, who writes over at Garnet and Black Attack, the Love it. SB Nation South Carolina blog. Mm-hmm. It made me want to run through a wall. Okay. I know how you feel about that. No one can stop the feelings going on down there at South Carolina. <laughs> Not even Justin Timberlake, Dan. I'm glad you said at South Carolina because you otherwise would have just said no one can stop the feelings happening down there. Big three-week run right now for South Carolina. They are feeling better about their selection of Will Muschamp. This is, you know, I don't know how much this game really factors into the SEC East race. There is an Armageddon scenario whereby South Carolina could win the SEC East if they've got four losses. I don't know how great I feel about that. I do know how great I don't feel about the Florida offense right now. I think the stat was it's been three straight weeks that they have failed to reach 250 yards of total offense. That's not good. No, that is not good. So for that reason and that reason alone, I am inclined to go South Carolina Plus the points, I don't think they win outright. But if South Carolina can get a quick score, if they can continue that momentum, um, you know, who knows what could happen? Could they keep it close against a team that really has just played defense with no offense? I think that's entirely possible. So give me South Carolina plus. So Florida super beat up everywhere. I'm going South Carolina plus the points. We agree. Okay. Agree. Also, six teams could go four and four in the SEC. Great. Awesome. Wonderful. Speaking of which, another high noon game, Kentucky at Tennessee. We've got Tennessee uh, minus 13 and a half points here. Do we talk at all about Jalen Hurd transferring? Uh, We may have briefly mentioned it, but he was not happy with how he was being used in the offense, and he is moving on from, from Knoxville. It would be cool, with no offense to our friends down in Tennessee, to see Kentucky be competitive in this football game. The fact that the yeah. point spread is only 13 and a half to me is a bit of a tell that Vegas thinks they could be. I would love to see them cover this point spread. Tennessee has not had a great track record playing down against opponents. I feel they're better. They should be a lot better than Kentucky. The fact that this line is only 13 and a half, which is goofy to say to me um, is speaking to me, Dan. Okay. It's speaking to me and it's saying going Wildcats. So I'm going to go Wildcats here plus 13 and a half. I totally agree with everything you said. I'm going Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, questionable Alvin Kamara, questionable Cam Sutton. They're just still so beat up. So I'm going to take the points. Saturday at high noon, another SEC game. It's SEC time. Yeah, buddy. At high noon, Mississippi State. Ooh. <laughs> Coming <laughs> off a big upset. There now. Let down. Poised for another big upset on the road. 29-point underdogs against <laughs> Alabama, Dan. Let down? Ask the question, could it be two in a row? Uh, I'm going to go Alabama minus whatever here. Um, yeah, I think so, too. I think there's a letdown spot for, for really both teams. So I'm just going to I'm gonna give those. Actually, you know what? No. 34 to 10, Alabama, Mississippi State covers. A little backdoor cover, perhaps? Why not? I guess. I mean, at a certain point, when you're only losing by 24, you can only feel so good about the situation. Another high noon game. Penn State minus seven on the road at Indiana. Bit of a dangerous mm-hmm. game here. Indiana's kind of fallen off our radar 
Mm -hmm. a bit, but still a pretty good football team, probably the best football team remaining on Penn State's regular season schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a tricky one. Penn State's running game right now with Saquon Barkley is on fleek, as the kids would say. Oh, not anymore. They don't tie. Now that you've said it, it's done. So I am inclined to go Lions minus the seven, which means I'm going to go Indiana plus the seven. Could be a close game wow. here in Bloomington. Yeah. Yeah. Penn State entering the top 10, maybe feeling a little bit too big for its britches. Um, I, I think the offense is operating at such a level. Where I'm just going to go with Penn State. I don't think it's the prettiest win, but I think they can win this game like 28 17. Another big one. Big game in the Big Ten. <laughs> yes. It's a battle for supremacy at the bottom of the Big Ten East. We've got a clash of titans here between Rutgers and Michigan State. Both are winless in conference. Michigan State's a 14-point favorite here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Michigan State's 14 points better than anybody, Dan. (laughs) Rutgers has been frisky. Rutgers has been frisky. I'm going to go Rutgers plus the points. Michigan State is staring down the barrel of potentially a 2-10 and ten season. They've got Ohio State and I believe Penn State still on their schedule. I don't feel this is a team at all prepared to knock off either of those two schools, Dan. So they need this one if they want to go 3-9 and nine and we assume losses in their final two games of the season. Just an incredible story in the world of college football. Seeing as how we thought so much more of Michigan State, they are disrespecting themselves at this point. (laughs) Give me Rutgers plus 14. Agree. Take those points. All right. Team of New York. Saturday, 3.30, Pitt at Clemson. Clemson minus 21, Dan. Any reason to think Pitt can keep this close? Mm, If they can control the ball, but I just don't think they will. Clemson, I'm going to give those points. Lock it up. Lock it up. Lock it up. Lock of the week. I think Clemson wins big, but I'm not going luck. I think there's a certain degree of momentum tied to this Clemson offense right now that I'm just going to, I'm going to choose to ride. All right. Texas Tech at Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State, 12 and a half point home favorite here. That's a lot of points, but I like Oklahoma State here. Laying the points against Tech. Give me the Cowboys. Uh, I think so, too. I think there's just so, there's only so many games Texas Tech can withstand losing efforts. I think Oklahoma State is a couple touchdowns better. I think they win this game 45-31. Saturday at four, it's a game that should have been so much more. (laughs) Stanford minus three on the road at Oregon. Dan, any hot takes for this game? Are you even going to watch uh, I am going to watch, uh, potentially with the internet's biggest and angriest Stanford fan, Ryan Nanny. Uh, Oregon, something like 1-7-1 and one against the spread this year. So Vegas definitely does not realize what Oregon is and is not. <laughs> uh, Stanford and Christian McCaffrey, Stanford and a, a legitimate very good defense, which is all the more impressive considering how bad the offense has been at times. Uh, I think it'll travel well. Uh, I think Justin Herbert will have his moments where people will be super encouraged about his future and moments where they'll be like, well, he's a freshman. So I like Stanford outright here. Oregon does not win this game. They, they're they in it for a good amount of time, but uh, I'm going to say 28-24. Nah, yeah, 28-24 Stanford. I'm going to go Stanford as well. Okay. And then finally, we got three games to talk about here at night. 7.30, I referenced this game earlier. It's the backup quarterback bowl between Ole Miss and Texas A&M. Somehow, one team is favored by 10 here, and that is Texas A&M. That feels like a lot of points to me. However, because of that, I must go opposite. I'm going to go Aggies at home and College Station at night, minus 10. Yeah, even without Trevor Knight, this wasn't a team that was really an air raid team at all. It's not like they were throwing the ball 50 times a game, every game, uh, relying on Travion Williams, even though he has sort of slid a little bit along with that offense. Uh, I think Texas A&M should be able to run the ball well enough against Ole Miss, who has not been good against running these bigger games. Uh, I think Texas A&M takes this one 34-21. Minnesota on the road at Nebraska, minus 7 um, 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 have you seen Minnesota's schedule? Yeah. It's just complete trash. It's not good. I'm going to go Nebraska here, minus seven. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go Nebraska. Well, 
So Tommy Armstrong is what day to day is considered right now, which we is incredible, he, by the way. It's incredible. Riker Fife is not good no. at playing quarterback in 2016 for Nebraska. Wish he were a little bit better in this game, but I think Nebraska should be able to do enough. What's the spread again in this? Seven game? points. Man. Minnesota's defense, it's hard to tell. Minnesota's played really good defense against bad teams. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to take Nebraska here by 10. Let's call it uh, 24-14. This feels like the kind of game that ends in a push. Yeah. Seven's a good line here. And then finally, 10-30, Pac-12 after dark. We've got Cal at Washington State. Washington State, uh, 14 and a half points, a home favorite. I would expect... A lot of points in a game like this, but Washington State's defense has actually been okay, better than they have Mm -hmm. been in the past. You like them a lot. I like them a lot. We're all staring down the barrel of a very meaningful Apple Cup. Is there any hope here for a team like Cal? You're going to wake up on Sunday morning, Dan, if you don't watch this game. I know you watch all these games, but... I will the, not be watching a 17-hour Cal Washington State game in its entirety. For the for the rest of us who decide to go to bed early, is there any hope of waking up on Sunday morning and seeing that Washington State lost this match? Uh yeah, I mean it was 60 to 59 2 years ago. So, you could wake up and have the game still be going on depending on where you live. Uh I'm going to take the points. I think it's going to be a shootout. I like taking points in shootouts. Washington State has been excellent this year, but uh, I think Cal has a game like the game from a couple years ago in them with Davis Webb. I think they're healthier at receiver, which has made a huge difference when they are healthy. You remember Cal beat Utah at home, so they do have an ability to play with some of the better Pac-12 teams. They beat Oregon in, what, double overtime, triple overtime, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. or just plain old overtime. Uh, I'm going to take the points here. I think Cal covers, but Washington State wins this game. Uh, maybe in overtime. So I think they're going to win by seven, 52 to 45. I am going to go points as well. Yeah. Woo! Woo! A lot of games here, Dan. <laughs> it was good Ric Flair from you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. That's all I got game-wise. I don't um, know if there's anything else here. Interested in discussing. There actually is. There is a really good game that we left out, and I'm being completely serious. Okay. Troy and App State. Now listen to me out. Is this a man named Troy? It is not a man named Troy. It is a man named Neil Brown coaching the Troy Trojans, who only lost to Clemson and barely. They are undefeated, as is App State, in the fun belts. And Troy is a decent offensive team. They've got a young coach. Uh, App State has been playing lights-out defense. App State against the Sun Belt, so we're talking within the context of their schedule, has played better defense than Michigan has against Big Ten teams. So Mm. we're just saying within that context. Okay. App State is really, really, really good defensively. Uh, and I think this is going to be a fun game. And you know what? It's at 3.30. There's not all that much at 3.30. I may watch some of this on, I think it's on ESPN3, watch ESPN. So, hmm. yeah, there's that. Um, anything else? I mean, we've. I wanted to shout out some, like, just fun performances, Ty. It's yeah. Kind of a weird week. Go ahead. Um, your boy, Quinn Flowers, continues to be dominant. USF, yep. USF, yep. Uh, Logan Woodside continues to be great for Toledo. He's the official uh, quarterback of the verbal. Uh, this is sort of related to you. Uh, Lou Holtz's son, Skip, mm-hmm. has put together a pretty prolific offense at La Tech that's worth mentioning. Ryan Higgins has been throwing to Trent Taylor and Carlos Henderson like crazy. Uh, speaking of big group of five defenses, San Diego State's defense. San Diego State's 8-1. and one. They only lost to South Alabama, which is strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're five and zero in the Mountain West, and this is how many points they've allowed in Mountain West play now: seven, three, three, zero, and thirteen. Wow, that's pretty good. That is pretty good. Uh, TCU, despite its weird struggles and up and down nature of their season this year, Traven Howard has been a tackling machine for them. Yeah, always like seeing that. Um, speaking of machines, uh, Jimmy Gilbert, Colorado, has forced like seventy three fumbles. Love seeing that. That's why Colorado's defense, in no no small part, has taken a huge leap this year. Uh, Memphis has an outstanding kick returner in Tony Pollard, a freshman receiver. He's got a couple touchdowns, 34 yards per return. And Western Michigan, row that bow tie. Uh, they have two players in the top 10 nationally against their conference in Corey Davis, who very well may be a first-round pick next year, and the running back Jarvion Franklin are both, in terms of longer plays from scrimmage, are just very good at generating long plays from scrimmage. Um, and also the Marshawn Lynch bobblehead. We mentioned it on Sunday, I believe. Oh, right, but right, right. 
that's just a wonderful thing in college football. It's where it worth bears repeating. It bears repeating. And uh, if anybody has an extra, send it to, to me or Ty. We'll send it you over. You can do that. Send it over. Um, yeah. And finally, Ty, just a quick request. This is just from me. Will you just do me a personal favor and drop that succulent, smothered, erupting <laughs> drum and fife? Erupting. Erupting, Ty. Erupting. Okay. Um, what do we got here? 1 p.m. disappointing uh, Lafayette squad uh, traveling to Colgate. Not, uh, not going to be a great game. The Patriot League's over already. It's over. It was clinched. I was there. That's true. You were. I'm I'm thinking of boycotting the Patriot League here. I'm a, I'm um, all in on Lehigh. I don't got time okay. for this. What? It, it, tight. How many Patriot Leagues? How many Patriot League games do we get all year? Actually, I'm not sure. It could be like <laughs> ten. It feels like it might be ten. It's it's right around ten. So I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy this game. Lafayette has a nice showing. Fordham at Holy Cross. Guess where they're playing this game, Ty? Um, Stadium Azteca. Stadium Azteca was booked, so they're okay. settling for Yankee Stadium. Oh, cool. The Crossaders are hosting the Rams of Fordham. I have a soft spot because of Joe Moorhead. Excuse me, future Oregon head coach Joe Moorhead. Yes, I. <laughs> Fast talking Northeasterner who runs tempo spread. Oh, okay. Uh, Joe Moorhead. Go Ducks. I see where you're going. Um, I'm going to go Fordham. I'm going Fordham as well here, playing at home in the Bronx. Uh, the Nellies Bucknell at Multisport Field to take on Georgetown. I'm going Georgetown here, Ty. You got to go Georgetown. So I saw Bucknell in the flesh right. last week. Let me kill this music here. This music's <laughs> getting on my nerves, okay? Um, I saw Bucknell in the flesh a week ago. What I said to you is they are starting like three corners that are like my size. Mm-hmm. Which again, granted, this is like Not great. FCS football, okay? That ain't big enough. That ain't big enough. So if right. I'm Georgetown at Multisport Field, I just throw all over the Nellies. Give me Georgetown and uh, give me Colgate. I forgot to make a pick in that first game. So we got a all 1 right. o'clock, so a, a 3 o'clock, and a 3.30 game in the Pat League. No Lehigh uh, this week. Quick thank you to, and these are people that shared the show, were kind enough, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or iTunes, get throwing us a, what, a review, a rating. Uh, so a quick thank you to Zach Mott, Nathan Fletcher, Ken Greeley. Love Ken Greeley. Always so generous with his shares. Uh, Seamus Maloney, great name. Bill French, Sam Watts, Carl Utas, David Fulton, and Elijah Justin. All very kind. And finally, we ride. We ride. We ride with Brandon McKissick. <laughs> Brandon McKissick, of course. All right. Well, thank you to everyone out there for tuning mm -hmm. in. Please give us a phone call at 408-VERBAL-1 as you're watching the games this weekend. It's off in the weeks like this where you're looking, you're thinking, ah, no big games, no upsets on the horizon. Oh, contraire, these are the weekends where it happens. So yep. if you see something, give us a phone call, 408-VERBAL-1. Let us know what's on your mind. We're also on Facebook on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Snapchat. Give us a holler. Let us know what's going on in your world. Dan, that's all I got. That's all I got. All right. Let's go get some sleep for that guy over there, Dan <laughs> Rubenstein. My name is Ty Hildebrand. Thanks again for tuning in. Catch you all on Sunday. In the meantime, stay solid. Peace.